illustrious illustrious scholar and political scientist is with, with us today we are extremely grateful to professor gopal guru for accepting our invitation to deliver the memorial lecture and we are delighted to have him amongst us his long and deep association with criticality of social and political issues that he shares with daya krishna is surely a reason to compel him to accept our invitation in spite of his very busy schedule and engagements with various activities we are we are also grateful to professor kel sharma for readily agreeing to preside today's lecture although he has some health issues this lecture was originally scheduled for 2020 but due to covid 19 we could not organize it earlier and compelled to hold it online surely it is not our first preference we are especially delighted to see many of many others professor balaganapati uh, professor daniel rave professor alok tandan professor ranjit ghosh anantagiri vijay mukherjee uh, sharman bagde and many others about uh, a word about foundation uh, would not be inappropriate perhaps so let me share a word about foundation The Krishna Academic Foundation was established in 2011 with seven founder members from different parts of the country, and since then we have been organizing the Krishna Memorial Lectures annually. Professor Minal Miri, Professor Dean Chatterjee, Professor Richard Sorabji, Professor Purushottam Billy Moria, Professor Arindam Chakravarti, Professor Janardhan Ganeri, Professor Garfield, and Shri Vats Goswami Ji have delivered these lectures consecutive, consecutively. we plan to publish them in form of book soon we are also uh, we also have been organizing national seminars since 2008 in jaipur lucknow jammu twice at bombay university vishwabharati shanti niketan in 2019 uh, where our dear founder prof uh, founder president professor bhatnagar rs bhatnagar was present among us to whom we miss very much and last we have joined and and the last we he had jointly with we had uh, jointly with presidency university kolkata just last week 9th and 10th december 2021 where many of you were also there we are delighted to inform that a short, special volume on the krishna guwahati university of general philosophy is published in the month of august 2021 we are really grateful to professor shorob uh, shoropran gosami i am not sure if he has joined us the chief editor of the guwahati university general philosophy Uh, it has been truly a pleasure to work with him and the editorial team more information about the special volume and the foundations available on the web page of the krishna foundation.org in and on the krishna.org the open library which is developed by daniel and ellis we are also uh, we also have been organizing the krishna essay competition for young scholars every year and we are inviting the winners of the competition to our annual seminars to generate their interest that in the in their jis uh, philosophical work two of them vinda shisha mary uh, non gobri uh, north eastern hill university strong meghalaya and madhavi prasad this is scholar at bombay university had joined our last seminar among some others coming back to the theme of today's memorial lecture there is both early and uh, later works if can be divided though i doubt doubt it very much demonstrate that we can have, have a dialogue with the various living tradi intellectual traditions of india and of the world the krishna developed his whole life to uh, to philosophical writings i'm sorry the krishna devoted his whole life to philosophical writings and questioned almost all the foundations and presuppositions of indian philosophy including moksha and purusharthas his concern for social and political issues in indian tradition also goes back to as early as 1954 when he published an article entitled uh, titled social change an attempt at a study in conflicting patterns of social action published in philosophy and phenomenological research again in another article published in 2017 socio political thought in classical india in a book called a companion to world philosophy edited by eliot dowsh and ron Bontek published in by with Blackwell 
In this article, Dayaji argues that the social political thought of India has not been the subject of any serious or detailed study. Indian tradition sees society primarily as the realm in which an individual has obligations to others as role as roles he or she occupies in the system coordinated with the claims of transcendent self as well as with the claims of all other beings including the god those relatives who were dead other living beings in the world the realm of dharma shastra vyavaha shastra and rajniti shastra need to be maintained in which an individual is situated but thinking about society was primarily undertaken in relation to the varna or caste class in terms of which society has been thought to be integrally constituted in today's lecture emancipation from moksha to nirvana professor guru will deal with these issues and make three modest claims and offer conceptual explanation in normative defense of these claims he is proposing to offer what could be understood as an unorthodox or dynamic conception of moksha this conception could appear to be quite dynamic if not radical when it is judged against the different conceptions that may fall in the logical class of orthodox conception of moksha he would also show how and how and uh, why an alternative conception that he proposes differs from orthodox conception of moksha he defines moksha as mukti or emancipation or the reflective act of disentangling one self from moral contradiction which in indian context or caste system represents mutually exclusive moral feelings of reverence and hence reification he also discusses in detail the phenomenon of self reification and mutual reification and argues in favor of vedkar and his conception of nirvana as the righteousness and cessation of uh, suffering Professor Guru is perhaps the best person to deal with these issues and throw light on the most complicated yet most meaningful experiences of our life. Once again, I welcome each one of you, and I am overwhelmed by your presence. We hope to have interesting discussion and interaction after the lecture. With these few words, on behalf of the Krishna Academy Foundation, once again I welcome each one of you to this memorable event. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, Professor Sharma, please. Professor Sharma. Now, should I formally request? Yes. <laughs> Professor Gopal Guru to deliver his lecture. Professor Gopal Guru. Uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, uh, inviting me to give a tenth professor Daya Krishna Memorial Lecture. I should also thank the organizers for having shown courage and confidence in inviting me to give a lecture on the topic, uh, uh, which. Uh, about which i don't think i have any uh, any 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 basic competence i feel also very overwhelmed by the list of speakers who actually spoke before me on the same uh, in the same series of uh, memorial lecture i don't know whether i i am fitting into the level and depth of scholarship that the speakers who spoke before me uh, must have covered. Uh, so uh, I would uh, go about talking of the conception of emancipation from moksha to nirvana. That is the title which was uh, given by me in my abstract. Uh, but I have added one word to my original title. Now it says Ambedkar's conception of emancipation from moksha to nirvana. Uh, when I was going through my own right text, I thought the whole argument is actually centering around the uh, 
uh, around the conception of moksha as it appears in Ambedkar's writings and speeches. So uh, I will uh, actually uh, build up my argument around this particular theme of Ambedkar's conception of, conception of emancipation from moksha to nirvana. Uh, I also don't have any competence to cover wide ranging philosophical theoretical topics that Professor Dayakrishna has covered during his illustrious career. Uh, so uh, it is needless on my part to reaffirm that in the study of Indian philosophy, Professor Dayakrishna's contribution to critical, critically understand the concept of moksha has been seminal. He, in his important essay on the three conceptions of Indian philo philosophy, discusses the idea of moksha with the purpose to evaluate and even interrogate the Western philosophical take on Indian philosophy. He, for example, joins issues with some of the Western scholars of Indian philosophy and argues that their approach to understand Indian philosophy is misplaced, if not flawed. It is misplaced because they use moksha as a singular category to approach Indian philosophy. Contrary to such, a, such approach, Professor Dayakrishna suggests that there indeed are more categories than one which can possibly be used to acquire precise and careful understanding of Indian philosophy. Professor Dayakrishna, in his attempt to sharpen his critique of the West, powerfully argues, and I quote him, blanket unitary claims of moksha category was allowed by these scholars to hide the real divergence of pursuit of knowledge interest in terms of Indian philosophy. Professor Krishna, in his uh, uh, critique of the West, further observes that it is wrong to use the category of moksha and use it to put Indian philosophy in a spiritual mood. Tying down moksha to spirituality for Daya Krishna again is a misplaced attempt. Daya Krishna's critique of Western approach to Indian philosophy has been endorsed by two eminent scholars of Indian philosophy, Professor, Professor Matilal and Professor Jain Mahanti. It has been also observed by Professor Daya Krishna that there are, there are some Indian philosophical systems like Naya Visheshika and Mimansa that do not deal with the idea of moksha at all. But I must confess my incompetence to take on board these philosophical systems and trace the genealogy of the concept of moksha. So it is advisable on my part to refrain from pursuing further this rather challenging line of inquiry. In this particular talk, therefore, what I have decided to do is to use the insight that Professor Dayakrishna has offered in particular relation to the concept of moksha, which he actually critically accesses himself. While reading Ambedkar's take on moksha, I found Professor Dayakrishna's insight on moksha quite relevant. He suggests that moksha is a concept which is relevant, which, which has relevance primarily in the lived life of people people. For him, thus moksha is a here and now concept. It is an ideal to be realized in the actual life of many people. While stating the relevance of this concept, under reference, Professor Daya Krishna further argues that common people would not have faith in moksha if it is an ideal was not realizable in actual life. Yes. Uh, such earthly con conception of moksha of Daya Krishna has been preceded by Dr. Bhim, uh, Bhimra Ambedkar. Bhim Ambedkar's conception of moksha or mukti or emancipation, I'm just using it interchangeably, we can discuss it in, in the question and answer session. Since early conception of moksha of Daya Krishna has been preceded by Professor Ambedkar's conception of moksha or mukti or emancipation, who, the, who also thought of moksha as here and now concept in early 20th century. The idea of moksha with different conception did dominate the public perception during Ambedkar's time in the, in the first half of the 20th century. However, Ambedkar seems to have given existing orientation to the concept of moksha in as much as it indeed is distinct from the different conception that are uh, available in the Brahmanical for example, the Brahmanical Hinduism, Charvaka, and even a variety, a variety of Buddhism. Ambedkar has a problem with all the three conceptions of moksha. For example, Ambedkar opposes uh, this Brahmanical conception of moksha, which has been imagined as a spiritual option that would release 
a person from the suffering resulting from cosmic time via cycle of birth and death. Under, understood from this angle, then achieving moksha depends on the consequences of, consequences of karma resulting from the sin committed by a person in his or her previous birth. If one believes to have done sin in previous birth, she or he will have to then wait for his or her release from moksha in next birth, in next birth only. In such spiritual scenario, moksha is made to await upon death. He or she can achieve moksha only after his or her death, no matter how much suffering a person has and had to endeavor during the actual life. For Ambedkar, therefore, surrendering to resigned fate or, a, or to reject circumstances created by Varna system or waiting for karmic compensation in next birth does not help at least the untouchables to achieve moksha or mukti. It is thus clear from Ambedkar's writing that he argues for moksha or mukti in this very lewd life and not moksha of the day. Ambedkar suggests that the social life of the untouchables on account of being wretched, degraded and humiliated was like a social death, which hence was all the time around the untouchables and was acutely faced by them. As Ambedkar does not define moksha as karmic compensation that in his estimate does not account for the moksha from social death caused by evils of caste and untouchability practices. Ambedkar's, Ambedkar's conception of moksha in view of his emphasis on manuski or mutual reverence, uh, to which I will make repeated reference in my talk. Ambedkar's conception of moksha in view of his emphasis on manuski or mutual reverence or mutual recognition, if you like that word, as universal moral good goes much beyond the Charvaka, Charvaka conception of moksha. I think we can debate this point as well. Ambedkar's conception of moral good goes much beyond the uh, Charvaka conception of moksha, which as argued by some scholars here, Professor Pradip Gokhale's references in order, based on karma and earth. Although some might defend Charvaka conception of a conception of moksha on the ground that it promises freedom to sudra and untouchables who have been denied even today the advantage of enjoying artha. Ambedkar does not seem to be contented with either with orthodox with this conception of moksha which has sought to offer democratized version of moksha meaning making moksha available for all the four varnas and thereby rejecting exclusive brahmanical claim on the spiritual resource of moksha. And here I think I'm quoting D. Is different in as much as he puts emphasis on. The word which also has figured in the debate on samta or equality in early 20th century among the Bhojan scholars. His conception of moksha is different in as much as he puts emphasis on the collective creation and sharing of mutual reverence or manuskir manushata in Marathi as human essence. It is in this sense Ambedkar's idea of moksha is starkly different from the Brahmanical conception of moksha, which is based on indistinguishable essence and which is exclusively embodied in Bhudeva, the god on earth. This would then mean that one, one can ask subtract only the shadow of a shadow of an essence from Bhudeva and use it for achieving moksha by becoming a, a Brahmin of some sort or maybe a Dalit Brahmin to, to, to just to uh, foreground the argument. For Ambedkar, the moral goods such as Manuski or Manushata or the feeling of mutual reverence 
he is already available in certain emancipatory philosophical tradition most most particularly buddhism and we through new interpretation need to critically evaluate such tradition for our emancipatory purpose <coughs> let us see in some details what is ambedkar's conception of moksha ambedkar's conception of moksha <coughs> Ambedkar in his writing on speeches, writing and speeches, takes recourse to the idea of moksha as mukti quite frequently and seeks to edge its relevance for untouchables by bringing it down from heaven to earth, as it were. He argues that moksha or mukti or emancipation of untouchables cannot be thought without grounding it in concrete context permeated by myriad forms of empirical experience of human being. as a as 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 is clear from his writing as feature again ambedkar's conception of emancipation is existential ex existential in nature in such conception emancipation of uh, through annihilation of caste matters so centrally and we also have existential emancipation emancipatory movement in the form of race matters or black matters it matters so intensely because it uh, uh, denies mukti or moksha to those who believe in social practices given by the by the ideology of caste for ambedkar ideology of caste poses major hurdle in achieving mukti or moksha it is the caste driven sense of duty regulated by regulated by religion that makes the achievement of moksha difficult i i, I take the opportunity to thank professor sundar sarkai Sarukai for bringing this to my notice. Ambedkar himself has underlined the seminal point, which suggests that every caste-loving Hindu practicing casteism is as a religious duty. He says, and I quote: "It must be recognized that the Hindus observe caste not because they are inhuman or wrong-headed; they observe caste because they are deeply religious." Thus, for Ambedkar perspective. For thus, from Ambedkar's perspective, expanding duty driven caste from the interpersonal human relationship is crucially important for achieving moksha. I think this quotation also appears in an important book written by uh, Professor Gurpit Mahajan on, on on the idea of India. Practicing caste out of religious duty militates against every human effort at moksha. But for Ambedkar, such a project of removing caste from social relation is quite challenging. It is challenging because it has to be achieved on earth, which, unlike heaven and hell, according to Ambedkar, is the most disputed kingdom. His own words. It is disputed. It is disputed because. Uh, it invites an intense and extensive human inter intervention into the project of annihilation of caste or achieving moksha from casteism so it so uh, moksha is from not to moksha to moksha to moksha to will come only in the last phase of uh, my talk at this level moksha in ambedkar has a negative thrust in that it six rejection of one social context permeated by untouchability and casteism moksha as a to reject moksha as active rejection of caste and not passive release from caste system is driven by the moral force of self determination that moves ahead with definite direction moksha for its realization thus would require self determination to move away from being a mute object and the word mute comes very often right from 1920 onwards in his uh, uh, discourse on emancipation moksha for its realization thus would require self determination to move away from being a mute object to becoming an active subject Ambedkar's determination to not to die as Hindu in 1935 did suggest a definite direction to moksha and later progressing into Buddhist nirvana. However, in Ambedkar's conception, the option of moksha for its realization does not follow rushing mode. On the contrary, 
Whereas for moksha has to subject itself to complex interplay of subjective and objective condition that have definite bearing on the progressive realization of the ideal of moksha. As the social dynamics of untouchable struggle for emancipation shows, the quest for emancipation from the existential condition seems to constantly growing, seems to be constantly growing along with the growth in moral power of self-determination for achieving moksha. If we consider moksha as not one-time given achievement or goal, but as the moral need to experience manuski or manushyata on everyday basis, then nirvana needs to be considered as work in progress. I mean, this is more explosive statement I'm making, but we have to find out. We will talk about Ambedkar's concept of nirvana in the last section of this talk. At the moment, uh, I would like to argue for the position such as that moksha is everyday realization and that necessarily grows from truth to truth. Truth does not move forward on its own. In fact, its forward movement depends on subjective response to objective conditions. I mean, this is a whole debate, subjective, objective. I'm not saying, I'm not, I'm not saying anything new about this. But I think we can't avoid these uh, usages uh, when we are dealing with uh, questions of moksha and emancipation. It is, uh, it is the truth condition that morally motivates mature and ultimately mobilizes the emancipatory consciousness in behavior of moksha. Arguably, ethical act of seeing, speaking, listening, communicating, dialoguing, conversing through writings, art and cinema form the truth condition. And this, I think, requires another detailed discussion, maybe a another paper for another webinar session. It is these conditions that propel truth to its higher levels where moral solidarity among human beings takes more, more mature form. Therefore, truth is nothing but an idea that is defined as good life, which is experienced collectively on everyday basis. Ambedkar's conception of, conception of moksha thus starts from truth and not from imagination, another position. Since it is, uh, it has to be grounded on the earth, which is a disputed kingdom. And therefore, uh, uh, so truth, uh, Okay, truth is nothing but an idea that is defined as good life, which is experienced collectively on an everyday basis. Ambedkar's conception of moksha thus uh, starts from truth and not from imagination. I would like to argue that Indian con in Indian context, truth at its initial expression resides in a social production of negative, uni negative unity of object and subject. In such negative unification or in separation of subject from object is mediated through stigmatized description that is ascribed to human being by those who have arrogated to themselves social power to bundle up certain people into such demeaning unification. Such negative unification is visible in the visceral reduction of human being to walking carcass or a mobile dirt or a moral or a moral menace. That can also be a positive uh, uh, elevation that would that would make the subject of one's own thought and self-understanding. Ideology of caste and its execution through untouchability phenomenologically converts a sentient being into a thinking object. Untouchables thus become that and that become them. But put differently, in Indian context, the category of object and subject is rendered indistinguishable by those who enjoy social privilege uh, 
uh, and imposing negative unity on certain sections of Indian society. Thus, accessing truth of moksha would mean seeking separation of subject from object. The first move towards moksha, therefore, is to assign value to oneself, the, to assign positive, emancipatory, transformatory value to oneself. Reverently revering one's life by breaking free from the hierarchical notion of reverence. Hierarchical notion of reverence, which has been defined by Ambedkar himself, borders on the social tensions between ascending sense of reverence for the toys born and descending sense of respect for the lower caste or ascending sense of contempt for the lower caste. However, one could also use a symmetry of the feeling of reverence in generic sense. Thus, it can be used for uh, it can be used to factor in the uh, factor in women, children as the victim of such asymmetry. The very initial truth condition that necessarily rests with the realization of one's quality and nature of uh, uh, quality and nature of one's social and intellectual existence. The desire for emancipation emerges in the subjective condition where normative constitution of I takes place. Such constitution of to higher levels of moral consciousness only involving the ethics of humility and humbleness but to self-assertion that could however such kind of subjectivism forms only the initial and not essential condition for achieving moksha why does subjectivism constitute an initial or the necessary truth condition and not essential Subjectivism can lead to social and moral phenomena of mutual reification, which may take two forms, traditional and perpetuated over time across space across spaces through phenomena of mutual reification however such phenomena of mutual reification given by ideology of caste hierarchy is different from the one that results from the modernist mode of atomistic individual in practice indian social context it is in indian in particular indian social context it is the notion of dharmic duty that makes mutual reification different it is dharmic duty enforced by caste but regulated by religion that perpetuates the asymmetry of the feeling of reverence between the upper and the lower caste. In such context, a person from untouchable caste, irrespective of his or her gender, class, background, have a dharmic duty to pay their respect 
to the upper caste irrespective of latest age and level of majority and rationality thus an elderly person from the caste that continue to be despised despised or compelled to pay full respect even to a kid from privileged caste the question of moksha in indian caste thus is firmly stuck in the tension between the ascending and the descending sense of reverence the indian social order in its public expression remains morally inegalitarian therefore and promotes socially exclusive but mutually hostile feelings that in effect produce and perpetuates the phenomena phenomena of mutual reification mutual reification however originates in the dominant desire of the privileged caste to preserve their status in other words it is the upper caste who have been historically sitting on the judgment and deciding what is morally good for the low caste and what is bad for them then dharmic then dharmic dictation is that there there the, then it is morally good for low caste to pay respect therefore the dharmic dictation that would result from this judgment is that it is morally good for the low caste to pay respect to the privileged conversely it is against the dharmic duty of the upper caste to treat the lower caste with reverence and we can see this latest expression of such pernicious asymmetry in the a feeling in the feeling of reverence in the tamil movie and it is translated into tamil movie called jai bhim jai bhim has been translated into many other uh, languages the social ascendant caste or the culturally superior caste first imposed from above the social binary such as good and bad reverential and reviling it has always been suggested that there are there these are limits and uh, moral limits of the lower caste and hence there is an urgent need uh, requirement on the part of the dalits or the untouchables or the lower caste to bring uh, element of social and moral reforms among themselves they need to achieve moksha on priority uh, and they need to be available for moksha at their own level this is the suggestion made by uh, dominant that, that is available in dominant narrative right from the anti colonial struggle in india but this dominant narrative has uh, no but this dominant narrative has no purchase in the emancipatory vision of a philosopher poet rabindranath tagore he finds ethical fault with the upper caste who inhabit india the poet predicts and i reproduce the quote in one of the writings on tagore i quote my country you will have to be equal in disgrace to each and every one of those you have been disgraced you have been disgraced millennially tagore is making a plea to refrain from producing disgrace for human being and tagore perhaps Uh, gandhi is not suggesting like gandhi is not suggesting equality in degradation defilement and disability or reducing oneself to zero so professor gayatri chakravarti spiwak using her powerful perception to further intensify the impact of tagore's agonizing observation recast the poet's concern in the following manner she says and i quote again the one you fling down will bind you down there both these profound observation do suggest that reification is coextensive and implicating its uh, logic both the lower caste and the uh, are implicating both those who disgrace and those who are at the receiving end of such infirmity the moral limits that are imposed from above on the under under privileged caste are also the limits of those who impose them at the first instance that is the privileged caste so i think both 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 the uh, both the ends are actually uh, implicated into this uh, logic of mutual reification or mutual humiliation the poet in his rather agonizing but passionately soul searching appeal is suggestive of the need for overcoming collectively mutual reification and replacing it with mutual reverence i'll just drink some water with your permission
Asha, how much time do I have? And, uh, take your time, say up to uh, what? And then it's 15 minutes. minutes now. Yeah, you can take another 15 minutes. Okay, I can take a little less than that. Yeah, yeah, sure. Please go ahead. So, uh, the poet in his rather agonizing but passionately soul-searching appeal is suggestive of the need for overcoming collective mutual reification, replacing it with mutual reverence. The idea of unity of good, mutual reverence, recognition, manushata, manuski has to be surely achieved in the sphere of eminence rather than in transcendence. For Tagore, uh, for Ambedkar and perhaps for Gandhi, unity of good has to be achieved in the lewd life only and not in another life or at the end of one's corporeal life. The Buddhist concept, uh, conception of Nirvana as, as thought by Dr. Ambedkar can provide an normative framework within which the unity of good or mutual reverence could be realized. Nirvana means being righteous in assigning moral value to oneself at the same time recognizing human value in human values such as Maitri in others. Uh, I and Sundar actually we discussed this concept in our book, last chapter of our book on everyday experience. Buddhist Maitri becomes social in that it is ethically a perfect action initiated by every person to rationally recognize the need for distribution of moral resources such as respect, regard and reverence. Maitri is aided by ethical conception of Buddhist Karuna which necessarily melts the passion for self-preservation into compassion up, up your law. Nirvana in Ambedkar's concern then would mean not detachment from passion but distribution of respect, regard and reverence. Maitri helps uh, uh, a person who has a case quest for righteousness that is Tathagata to make these feelings mutually grounded in the everyday form of social interaction shaped and regulated by eightfold noble path of Arya Stangik Maradha. This would mean, unlike the Arthavada's construction of Moksha, the Tathagata is right there in the midst of humanity, trying to remain on the righteous path to Maitri. Meaning one does not become Moksha Data. This is Ambedkar's famous dictum. Moksha Data in Arthavada's construction of Moksha or gifting spiritual advantage of Moksha to others by throwing, giving knowledge and or on prasadam. But Marga Data or Redeemer of Mutual Respect and Tathagata is the Margadatta, who, is, who, is who as the member of community of human, hum, humans is taking moral initiative in making Nirvana as an ideal to be realized on everyday basis. In doing so, Tathagata or person in quest for Nirvana is mindful of the need to push his or her, his or her Of fellow travelers who are equally earnest, upright, and motivated in joining others in such efforts to become Nirv to achieve nirvana on an everyday basis. It is in this sense one who guides himself or uh, or is or is in the company of others becomes margadatta, who guides oneself and not mokshadatta, one who offers moksha to others. Uh, uh, I think I will stop here, Raja. And uh, we will possibly have some discussion. Thank you yeah, very much for your definitely. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. So the lecture is open for discussion, please. People can write uh, their yes, comments or queries. Yes questions in the chat box or they can raise personally if they want.
to start with, maybe, maybe I can just uh, raise a few issues. Uh, first issue is regarding this, uh, the mutual reverence, the concept of mutual reverence. Um, I can see that this concept of mutual reverence, which you are developing, is uh, very different from the concept of mutual respect or mutual yeah. dignity. Uh, so, yeah. uh, I mean, how do you differentiate between the two? Because normally we talk about in a democratic system, we uh, and also the liberalist uh, kind of uh, uh, setup, we talk about mutual respect and mutual dignity rather than mutual reverence, but you're talking about mutual reverence. That's the first point. The second uh, point is regarding that, um, is this the concept of mutual reverence absolutely an ideal concept or is it uh, realizable in the Indian context? And I mean in Indian context. And the third point is regarding this, uh, I mean, since you brought uh, Ravina Tagore into the context, and I'm sure you are familiar with the Okay. I can. I think you can start, and then you know we might have more. Okay. Documents. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Vasha, for your uh, very important intervention. Now, first, you said what is the difference between mutual reverence and mutual recognition? Uh, so, uh, I think uh, there is a very uh, thin distinction between the two of them. Uh, maybe they actually overlap in terms of their essence. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, just as mutual reverence is unconditional, you don't put any conditionality when you are actually assigning uh, uh, reverence to yourself and reverence to others. And that uh, happens through, uh, uh, you know, your initiative to actually uh, create conditions for this reverence. For example, uh, you should, uh, uh, in reverence, you should fundamentally recognize a person, a person who actually corporeally exists along with you. And uh, uh, reverence means you have a regard for that person. You, you actually regard that person of, uh, of equal worth uh, as a human being. And if you don't regard our uh, that person, then I think you are not uh, you you are not reverential to that person uh, anymore. So that uh, uh, that uh, that can be uh, accorded to a person through, for example, you look at a person in the morning when you are crossing a person, you don't avoid a person. You just uh, say hello to him, or you don't. Uh, now you don't. I mean, you nowadays people actually avoid people by using cell phone as if they are so busy. They want to. They don't want to see. They don't don't want to look at that people. That is irreverential. So I think this is a very simple. Uh, uh, ordinary uh, experience of revering each other. Uh, so, uh, so, but recognition also is uh, very close to this kind of uh, conception. Now, I don't think there's any difference. You have to recognize human being as human being at the first instance. You, you, you have to actually, act, you have to acknowledge that there is somebody who's, uh, uh, who's like me and uh, uh, we, we have no reason rationally to disregard or uh, discount on anybody. So that is, I, I think there's, there is a very thin uh, line of difference between the two, or there's, there is overlap between the two. Okay. And uh, I think right. it's, it is, it is, it is real, uh, this ideal which is realizable. Okay. Which is realizable. I mean, if you don't realize, then your life becomes uh, sick. 
uh, at a, a sink of sickness. And so I think we have to emerge out of that. And so I think it is it is realizable. If it is not realizable, I think the society has no future at all. It is it has to be realizable. The ideal which is not realizable is a platonic one. You just it is ideal it is ideal because it is not it is impossible to achieve. So we are not looking for that kind of ideal. We are looking for the ideal, idealizing relation on a, a relationship between human beings on a everyday basis. Otherwise, life becomes uh, undisputed hell. Uh, sorry, dis undisputed help as far as climate care is concerned. We don't want to go get into that kind of scenario. Yeah, but Professor Guru, actually, you know, I mean, even after, um, for example, um, Ambedkar's uh, ideas and also, you know, the kind of uh, application in the society, uh, after so many years, almost uh, more than 70 years, things have not changed. Yes. Uh, so, I mean, in what sense this is, you know, realizable because, I mean, uh, I'm talking about Indian context. I mean, surely, theoretically. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it is slow but realizable. It is uh, It is not actually, it hasn't, it hasn't achieved as very a spectacular success. Uh, as, as we can see in society, people uh, follow uh, uh, asymmetrical or hierarchical notion of uh, respect. Uh, and, and uh, that is expressed through your speech act, your body language, your uh, status, everything. So, but you know, there are also uh, examples where you find that people really uh, uh, do respect. But that is a very slow process. That's a very slow process. I mean, maybe I don't know, but in uh, uh, in, a, in our in, in our context, the process is very slow. Yes. Sure. Uh, yeah. Uh, and may I ask a question? There's one more left, Alupji. Just yeah, this okay. yeah, this so, is, so. you're referring to Chandalika Asha. Yes. Yeah. So I think that's a very interesting play, and I was. Uh, I'm sorry, Chandalika. I I met Chandalika. I'm sorry. Yeah, okay, yeah Chandalika. Yeah. So uh, I think it's a very important uh, play written by uh, the poet. Yes. Yeah, so uh, there is a dialogue. Uh, there's a there is a uh, there's uh, there is a dialogue uh, which involves three people. I mean, there's uh, Buddha, Ananda, and Chandalika, and our mother as well. Yeah. Uh, so I think uh, uh, this is uh, uh, Chandalika actually has to reconcile with the order of uh, uh, the Sangha and the principle right. set of principles. Right. And and when the realization occurs to her, that is her moksha. That is her nirvana. Yeah. So see, but this is different from the one which we find in Sanskara of Anand Murti, where mm -hmm. uh, uh, Chandri actually emancipates the Pranisha Charya. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, so there are different uh, uh, versions of moksha. But the one which uh, uh, which is portrayed by the poet is uh, uh, very very superior. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank Can you. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, Yes, Alokji. Alok, Alok, yeah. uh, Namaskar Gopal Guruji. Namaskar. Uh, your face after a long time. Thank yeah, you very God much. God. For... <laughs> uh, but uh, I feel, I am wondering what was the need for Ambedkar to go for the vocabulary of moksha yes. and nirvana, which yes. already has so much metaphysical baggage. Uh, yes. with it. And yes. uh, this confuses a lot uh, the followers of Ambedkar, yes, and that's yes. why I think there are not many uh, uh, followers of Neo Buddhism, though they are active yes. in politics of uh, uh, caste, mm -hmm. but they are not so much convinced by the Buddhist approach to moksha and nirvana. Yes. And and, and uh, my second so, so what was the historical necessity? What was the logical necessity? Uh, in which uh, he was working, why not he took a simple concept of uh, emancipation, uh, just like a Marxist concept of emancipation, secular one. Why did he go back to the religious conceptions? And uh, this, this is, uh, I think this confuses a lot nowadays, mm. people like me. And how this con his concept of nirvana is uh, different from the Buddhist 
the classical buddhist concept of nirvana yeah yes yeah so uh, yeah so thanks uh, alokji for your uh, intervention <laughs> uh, you uh, uh, you made the point you were actually haunting me uh, for a while and uh, thank you for raising that point of uh, why why did ambedkar feel it necessary to actually use the word moksha when it is actually uh, uh, considered by uh, <laughs> new buddhist as an abstract literally uh, uh, expression which doesn't belong to buddhism so why does he, why did he why did he satyendra kumar ji please sorry uh, satyendra kumar ji could you please uh, uh, stop your audio yeah can i can i yes please can i continue yes yes so uh, the first point that uh, alok ji was raising was why did he feel it necessary to use this word moksha because certain concepts are actually the part of the discourse moksha is a part of the discourse and moksha has relevance and resonance in the dalit thinking as well because you know uh, uh, dalit uh, saints have actually used uh, moksha very frequently and the the they they actually locate moksha in terms of devotion to god and sokamela is one important uh, uh, saint who actually has this centrally has uh, used it centrally and uh, he has follow, he had followers in maharashtra so it was already uh, there in the uh, in the, in the dalit uh, image uh, perception so uh, he was uh, the dr ambedkar was so uh, uh, perceptive about using it because he wanted to subvert this concept uh, uh, from within making it uh, uh, giving it a different meaning radical meaning as, as i said bringing it uh, down from heaven to earth as a moksha is simply mukti emancipation you are you are actually uh, liberating yourself emancipating yourself from something which uh, is actually uh, making your life hell so that was the context and also in the in the uh, non dalit discourse moksha was being used very frequently so it was already uh, uh, it was it was imperative on his part to use this uh, the second point you are raising was about the difference between the classical and ambedkarite notion of nirvana i think the classical uh, as far as I, i i can see and i have read some literature on this is that you know you are actually emptying out yourself uh, uh, of all the uh, of all the uh, uh, sufferings uh, ill feelings uh, or or uh, yeah the sense of uh, uh, what enmity envy and all that uh, or uh, Uh, what what they say is our greed uh, and so you 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 have to actually undergo this odious uh, exercise of actually following this uh, but you can do it yourself uh, maybe in a solitary exercise but in ambedkar's i think is the one which also has uh, uh, a little bit politics of actually uh, making it Uh, universalizable the idea is universal but it is not universalizable so to make it universalizable uh, you have to actually bring it uh, into the midst of the people who are actually uh, affected by social evils so that uh, so there is a there is a force of some kind of uh, politics behind this and that's why his uh, his is uh, a dialogue with the buddhist bhikkhu actually is driven by the sense of activity action initiative working with the people in the struggle so that's how it is slightly different from the classical so can i ashaji may i speak ashaji may can i ashaji ashaji can you hear me 
हाँ yes. नमस्कार सर नमस्कार अभिमन सर मैं हिंदी में बोलूंगी एक तो जो अभी आलोक जी ने पॉइंट बताया कि हाउ द कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ निर्वाण डिफर्स फ्रॉम द क्लासिकल बुद्धिस्ट कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ निर्वाण एक मेरे दो तीन रिमार्क्स ही हैं तो ये संदर्भ में मुझे लग रहा है कि निर्वाण टर्म इज यूज इन इन बुद्धिस्ट लिटरेचर इन पाली लिटरेचर में तो बहुत ये तो ह्यूज है हमें इसके बारे में कुछ पता नहीं है लेकिन लेकिन इज कंसिडर्ड इज स्टेट ऑफ स्टेट ऑफ अंतिम शुद्धि और चित्त शुद्धि परम सुखम एंड इज अहम विसर्जन सो देन हाउ how it it can be how the the ambedkar's concept can be called a neo buddhist concept somewhere you use this neo buddhist this is first remark the second one is aur jahan hum is in sab ko moksh ko aise dekhte hain to mujhe nahi lagta ki ye kahin divergent hai brahmanical aur aur shamanic tradition se ke beech mein hai ye ek charcha की बात है दूसरा रिमार्क एक 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 और माइनर रिमार्क है मुझे लगता है कि कि जो जो दो टर्म मोक्ष है फर्स्ट वी हैव टू लुक इट इज सिचुएटेड और अखर एंड वी सी दैट वी फाउंड इट इज व्यूड इन द ट्रेडिशन इंडियन ट्रेडिशन और वैदिक ट्रेडिशन इज समम बोनम एज इन पुरुषार्थ चतुष्ट है इट इज कंसिडर्ड एज दी ऑफ ह्यूमन सीकिंग और ह्यूमन गोल्स एंड एंड ऑल्सो व्यूड एट both the level empirical that means in life and transcendental level, level that is after life the mm. other words for these two stages is called jivan mukt and vidhe mukt now while um, if we what we heard it seems that ambedkar's moksha or emancipation in a secular term the word is being used only at socio empirical level where it is freedom from social inequality or hierarchical notion of reverence or even or asymmetricity of reverence so it is being used in totally different context yes sir wah wah yeah the the third ek uh, one more clarification i i um, i request you to kindly highlight on this that what is the phenomenon of mutual reification this is still not clear and it is one of the central concept in your talk reverence to samajh mein aa gaya but what is mutual reification and self reification hmm there are two more question i think uh, thank you sir kindly okay, hi thank you so should, i think uh, start from the last question what is uh, what is not clear is so the the phenomena of mutual reification right right sir that you know you uh, it is a, um, logically it is against mutual recognition Uh, oh. so, so you reify yourself into your own status, and uh, uh, you do not really have a uh, need to take initiative. Really, come out from that particular uh, state of self-preservation. Mm. And uh, so uh, you remain there, and uh, you actually uh, militate against all that influences that try to destroy your own status. you want you want how you want the untouchables will take objection to their own emancipation they would say they would find purpose in being un, uh, being uh, remaining in under state of unfreedom because they are they fear that if they actually become free then i think they they will have to face some cost they have to face some challenge or they will have to incur some cost so i think that's why it is a it's a mutual reification the moment you discover yourself are uh, remaining mukha there is a reification and the other person also is uh, the other person for example from patriarchy or from caste or from race also is a uh, condition and imprisoned by his own concerns of self preservation so it is re- mutual reification i require you for my own reification mutual reification is that Uh, which is which is against mutual re- reverence. Mutual it's reverence has to actually necessarily transcend these self-imposed boundaries, uh, our uh, uh, self-imposed restrictions. 
Mm. Uh, so that is the moksha. I mean, if you want to use that word, okay. it's a very practical, radical term in Ambedkar. And I agree with you that this is not something which is, which actually is developing the critic of the moksha as it is uh, viewed in terms of uh, its uh, origin elsewhere in Vedanta. So uh, you you have uh, very uh, actually I'm trying to develop a kind of a theoretical account for understanding moksha. So I'm starting from. Uh, uh, I'm starting from uh, the separation of object and sub subject. Then how does it happen so through self through of self determination? All that I'm developing and coming up to. Uh, uh, so can I ask a question? Yeah. So I think this is the uh, the last. Uh, by Shraman, I'll just complete take one more point. Uh, it's not uh, in America. It's not anthem. It is on an everyday basis. It's an everyday basis. It's not anthem. So one has to realize it on everybody. So your neighbor has to actually greet you every morning. So that greeting is not fake. It is. It has to be. It has to be very genuine and authentic. Other we have a very fake smile on our face. That doesn't mean that the person is revering you. So there should be some kind of an ontological link between what you express and what you pursue. Is it not? So that link is missing, and that's why uh, it's not. And it has to be expressed on everyday basis. So can I uh, put my question? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, please. Uh, Sir Jai Bhim, this is Pramod Bhim. Jai Bhim. Yeah, okay. Sir, you characterize Ambedkar's conception of emancipation as collective endeavor. Yeah, and that is very distinctive uh, remark because in Indian philosophy, uh, the uh, concept of moksha is highly atomistic, individualistic, mm -hmm. and this. Uh, your characterization of ambedkar nirvana as a collective endeavor this is what distinguishes uh, ambedkar conception of moksha uh, nirvana yes. from traditional on the, on the art, on, yeah. i would like to know from you uh, any collective activity is a political endeavor so doesn't uh, the ambedkar idea of emancipation uh, kind of intertwines the political and ethical dimensions yes The nirvana is essentially a political um, project, so to say, and but it it needs to be transcended. We have to go beyond the political in order to achieve the universal requirement for a universal reverence. Yes, so use with plus. I agree with you, Saman. I mean that's what I was suggesting. The very moment when Dr. Ambedkar says that it is the most disputed, Earth is the most disputed kingdom. It only means that now you require some political intervention or reason coming from outside to actually uh, sort out this uh, dispute. Okay, but at the same time you don't have uh, undisputed uh, imagination of undisputed heaven or hell. You don't want to go to heaven or hell. So that is uh, that's why it is deeply political at some level. And I agree with you. And there are actually transcendence itself is not intuitive or uh, God given. It has to be. it has to be for it has to be actually produced through your human human inter intervention a human intervention is uh, multiple i think it is social ethical intellectual political uh, it is uh, analyst it, it is actually historically situated sociologically constituted and politically activated so that's why it is deeply political i agree with you so nirvana is a collective endeavor not to actually uh, uh, not to wait for it but to actually force Uh, force it, yeah. To you know, force it in a right direction that you enjoy. You actually realize this collective or mutual reverence because maitri is nothing but uh, having mutual reverence for each other. You don't discount, you don't degrade people, don't defile people, don't revile people, and that happens. You might say, "Then how does it happen? Is it is it a?" Uh, is it a message given by god no i think you have to rationally realize that no it is everyone's need yeah can i yes. invite uh, professor balaganapati asadi oh, hello Alice, professor sanjeev mukherjee yogesh uh, and others well, uh, sir ranjit ghosh is raising his hand for a yeah, long time please go ahead oh really i'm sorry uh, yeah uh, thank you uh, thank you professor guru asadi uh, also i thank Uh, now i want to take you back 
to i have every regard for uh, ambedkar uh, but i want to take you back to the emancipation proclamation made by lincoln in the year 1863 where mm-hmm. he made uh, the, a clear cut it he made it a clear cut legal document but uh, ambedkar when he tried to bring emancipation to the lower caste through the constitutional means and uh, he uh, ambedkar was after all a, a man of our tradition so he made the entire thing a normative rather than a legal one because mm-hmm. you see the, the 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 american proclamation the proclamation made by lincoln was totally a rigid legal document whereas in indian constitution we find all the normative elements uh, which uh, were also uh, uh, expressed in the guise of uh, legal one but actually the sense or meaning is normative so mm-hmm. for that reason uh, even if uh, he has made all the provisions it would not be realizable in practice mm-hmm. even after this 70 years of it how would you react to this uh, yeah. thank you this single yes. question yes. thank you uh, professor anjit ghosh uh, for your comment uh, and question so uh, basically comment so uh, i think uh, yeah so uh, uh, dr ambedkar actually threw his lot in the normative uh, mode he always thought that people may not be amenable to uh, legal injunction reason coming from legal legality state on that and and uh, ultimately we will have to actually uh, reform ourselves in uh, uh, through our own, through our own experience uh, which is not very very uh, healthy and which is not very very pleasant uh, because you know uh, we all, all the time try to avoid people on cast uh, several basis so that has to be done only from the normative mode uh, or maybe through conversion and that's why he said with this conversion conversion is an important device to do it an uh, important option to do it but uh, he he can he could really come to this conclusion only after he found limitations of legal intervention because he actually started uh, he actually prescribed legal in legal in legal injunction or provisions for actually reforming people making them more social more egalitarian more uh, friendly to justice and friendship and liberty but that is not happening so he has opened up a different channel which is more sustainable more doable because people don't have, people have one develop constitutional morality to follow constitutional principle they violate it on every day basis so i think that limitations he realized and so therefore he went on to um, uh, offer this conversion but some people now would say like a indian constitution also based on buddhist principle that is fine but in practice i think uh, you have to follow normative principles only because human beings after all in the relationship between two humans is so important and uh, so that is uh, that is there and he was actually as a good pragmatist was trying legal as a first as he also realized as a philosopher that there is a limitation in this uh, instrumentalities yeah if i can uh, thank you sir thank you uh, thanks yeah can i prove sir rasham kuchi uh, yes please go ahead yeah thank you uh, thank you so much professor guru for this uh, very interesting exposition uh, of a uh, uh, movement from moksha to nirvana uh, i have uh, two quick observations the first one is with regard to nirvana Uh, and many people have uh, in fact raised their concerns regarding this and i uh, i noticed uh, I, i think you have done it intentionally that in between you mentioned the nirvana to be work in progress without yeah. elaborating you just left it like that so i thought i should ask you on that you no know? uh, <laughs> how how, how do you look at that because uh, 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 i think one of our uh, uh, other friends here has said 
in Indian conception of Nirvana is atomistic and individualistic. In fact, mm -hmm. when it comes to Buddhism, we have Mahayana Buddhism where uh, Buddha takes birth to emancipate everybody. Mm -hmm. so it, it's it's uh, uh, togetherness that is very important. And he believes that until everybody gets liberation, he will not get uh, liberated. So yes. this community, you know, coming mm -hmm. togetherness, collectivity, uh, a nirvana of collectivity is already stressed in uh, um, Mahayana Buddhism. So when you say work in progress, do you have that in your mind or alternatively, do you have like, do you want to displace nirvana from the space of uh, end mm. and want to make it a means? Mm. If that is the case, what is what would be the end? No, that's that's what I would like mm. to know. Uh, mm. This is the first observation. The second mm. one is very interestingly, you mentioned this. Uh, I think therefore you are right. Mm. <laughs> that's that really attracted me because I was looking at this Cartesian uh, dictum uh, because you are also uh, rela relating it to that and mentioning that. I think therefore I am. But I instead of uh, making it, I think therefore you are. I would, uh, I, I have this in my mind, uh, which is the reversal kind of one. Uh, you think therefore I am, okay, you think therefore I am. And in order to emancipate from that, I reach, I think therefore I am. So the mm. process of emancipation, the social emancipation at least, mm. political and social emancipation is, um, is a movement from you think therefore I am to I think therefore I am. So hmm. how you respond to this? Thank you. So yes, yes, much. yes. I think, I think, I think you, thank you very much uh, for your very perceptive uh, comments. I think this, the last one is very interesting. That I think the, uh, there is, a, I think therefore I am is one initial condition without which I think therefore we are uh, doesn't appear at all. So the ultimate would be we think therefore we are. And so that's the ultimate. Uh, 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 achievable goal, uh, achievable ideal. And so, uh, uh, so uh, I, 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 so we have to move away from. Uh, uh, I think, therefore, you are. To I think, therefore, I am. To we think, we are. So that is the journey. So nirvana means, you know, this is a. When I said, uh, growing from truth to truth is this, this moment. Okay. So that I, I think is a very you put it very perceptively, and I thank you. I thank you very much for that. Uh, the other one is very tricky question. I mean, it's a very uh, complex question. Uh, whether I'm treating nirvana, I'm, I, I, am I really dis 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 displacing it from the very uh, very discourse of emancipation, uh, or I am actually reducing it to the to to the, to the level of means and ends? I think it's it is it is also. Uh, it, 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 has, it has both the dimensions, end and main. There is no separation at all. Uh, when you are actually, when you are actually uh, uh, using Arya Stangik Marga or ethical injunctions in Buddhism, you are in a way uh, using them, using within quotes, using them to actually uh, uh, become a sentient being. So you are in a way having uh, some kind of some kind of a project, some kind of a, a framework in your mind, which is, if it is, if it is ideal and there somewhere at the Everest, you will actually find it so difficult to approach it. But if it is actually reduced to your everyday experience as the end, I think that will actually, that will have an immediate and perhaps profound impact. So you, you transform it at your own level. And so that is why I think, and this is a very problematic uh, proposition I'm proposing that Nirvana is work in progress. But if Nirvana itself, uh, Ambedkar himself is actually asking people to actually reform and show their, uh, their, their change in their everyday experience, their own everyday behavior. But that doesn't happen. And there are, there's a critique of Buddhist practices in Maharashtra and in India. There are very few Buddhists who actually have this. Um, Nirvana has a goal to be achieved on an everyday basis. You know, if you if you are not actually realizing Nirvana on an everyday basis, then I think you are postponing the very project of Nirvana. Thank you. Thank you. Find the, okay, thank you.
थैंक यू सो मच मैडम थैंक यू सो मच सर फॉर सच ए वंडरफुल डेलीब्रेशन टू एड समिंग एंड आई थिंक इट वॉज ए मिस्टेक टू डिड नॉट इंक्लूड द नोशन ऑफ विवेकानंदा स्वामी विवेकानंदा वेन यू मेन्शन लाइक कॉन्सेप्ट लाइक मोक्ष निर्वाण आर इमेंसिपेशन Uh, there is this conception that we can use moksha nirvana or emancipation only in the transcendental or non empirical sense okay while we can use these things in a completely empirical sense and uh, i would like to quote uh, since all of you mentioned that emancipation i would like to quote uh, there is a statement uh, of a great communist leader hiren mukherjee hmm. he wrote about sam vivekananda that uh, it is blessing that we had only Uh, in our midst a young uh, philosopher like swam vivekananda his contribution is immense for the emancipation of the entire humanity especially in the context of india this is why uh, one like me this is why one like me a skeptic and atheist salutes this tremendous man of faith and of action who gave back to his stricken people the long lost pride in their uh, in their work uh, in their manhood that is sir uh, uh, i don't know sir uh, i have uh, read uh, uh, gandhi ambedkar and also some uh, research scholar but uh, people completely ignore the interpretations of religion or dharma or the emancipation or the nirvana uh, done by swami vivekananda so yeah. uh, uh, that is my uh, submission sir and even uh, i think uh, someone mentioned the contribution of abraham lincoln or bala sahab mentioned that like uh, that is uh, the concept uh, of uh, nirvana in Mah- mahayan uh, i have just uh, completed the autobiography of nelson mandela and there is very good uh, uh, similarity between the buddha and nelson mandela i am just uh, last sentence sir Uh, but i can rest only for a moment for with freedom comes responsibility and i dare not linger for my long walk is not at end it that is the long walk to freedom that is he say that uh, i am not just fighting uh, for the freedom of the black people rather for the entire uh, even those people who are living in the south africa uh, mm-hmm. non black so this is something uh, sir i i need your uh, interpretation sir that why people overlook the contribution of vivekananda in this matter yeah i think I, I, i agree with you i think we need to really take a comparative account of moksha wherever it existed but you know by i have already expressed my inability to cover everything and so uh, certainly we should take up uh, this issue uh, in the next uh, uh, deliberation Yeah, there are di- there are uh, different conception of moksha, and I have not covered all of them, and that is my deficiency. I agree. With. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, would we invite some more questions or comments? Asha, can I ask a question? Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, Daniel, Professor Daniel Ravi. Um, yes, Daniel. Thank you, Gopal. Thank you, Gopal, for the talk. I wanted to ask if you can elaborate on the concept of Maitri, which you mentioned there toward the end. Mm. maitri which you presented perhaps as an alternative or complementing ideal to mm. to the concepts of moksha and nirvana and if i remember correctly from 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 your and uh, sundar's book we were talking mm. about maitri as a social contract yes so 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 what what is the relationship between maitri and the two the two concepts that you you discussed yeah So Maitri and uh, Maitri and and uh, what? Nirvana and Moksha. Yeah. So uh, Daniel, thanks. Uh, uh, so uh, Maitri actually is inclusive of uh, both. I mean, first Mait Moksha. When you actually begin to really Uh, see the worth of other people and consider them to be of uh, some importance and dialogue you begin to actually open up the window for wider spheres of maitri 
maitri is a much larger wider uh, sphere of interaction uh, so moksha of course is to really uh, go into that direction but moksha of course uh, uh, moksha of course is uh, uh, moksha the the way you actually define moksha uh, not in terms of uh, moksha as an ideal to be uh, not uh, to uh, to to achieve uh, moksha as an ideal impossible to achieve not that kind of uh, conception of moksha but the moksha which actually uh, sees some kind of uh, value in other person and also assigns some value to oneself and that's actually uh, the first stage uh, so you actually make yourself qualified or available for maitri so for that i think you have to actually assign some value to yourself that you are also worth making friendship with uh, uh that's why you find that the dalis and untouchables find themselves to be isolated unattended abandoned without friends but that kind of separation you seek and that's called moksha the nirvana you come to you have a fellow travelers with you okay and you have to actually uh, travel with them on the condition that they also share the same vision and some same concern they are upright and uh, they are uh, committed motivated uh, to actually uh, create this sphere of mutual reference then it actually creates a larger sphere of maitri maitri which is which will therefore become social because it is wider it is universalizable and so i think uh, there are more maitri is on the top even in even in uh, even in buddhism ambedkar's buddhism maitri is on the top and not even karuna and pragna karuna of course can lead to some kind of uh, some kind of a guilt that can be um, that can be melted into your passive compassion so uh, so maitri is on the top which is a larger social sphere which has to be actually consciously rationally produced through these three stages my moksha separating oneself from of the object and then that taking nirvana is taking others along with is a common endeavor and to actually create such a larger sphere of maitri uh, which is a social which is also universal in a way i don't know whether i have really answer your question daniel uh, uh shall i add something sir uh, please go uh. ahead Uh, the thing is uh, when uh, ambedkar was very much uh, disgusted with uh, the hindu way of life and manushruti uh, he was one time about to put it into the flames and on gandhi's insistence he stopped it then he tried all the religions he first tried the sikhism and then islam and then other religions and ultimately he reached at the buddhism and there he found that it is the religion which can uh, bring the emancipation in the true sense of the term because of its uh, uh, the 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 way the, the concept which you have used the maitri that mm. that itself is a concept which uh, suggests that the progress is from we to i and not from i to we so that is how yes. uh, ambedkar uh, took uh, buddhism and and uh, with uh, his two lakh supporters he converted yes. himself into buddhism in the last phase of his life so this is the situation which ambedkar knew very well that is yes. I, thank you sir thank you yeah yeah i agree with you yeah that's it yeah uh, professor sanjeev mukherjee if you are there would like to say something professor sanjeev mukherjee uh, sanjeev is there hi sanjeev uh hi gopal nice to hi, see hi. you great to see you on screen uh well uh, i was uh, wondering about uh, the social conditions of uh, uh, emancipation that Uh, ambedkar was talking about when he talked of an, the annihilation of caste now uh, i am asking this question because historically we have found that all these all such projects all such major projects of restructuring society breaking down social institutions have resulted in newer kinds of monstrosities whether it's the communist monstrosity or mm. others yes. so uh, so uh, should we make a distinction between uh, 
breaking down Brahminism and mm. hierarchy and not the annihilation of caste, can we think of an alternative where all jatis, not castes, all jatis mm. are equal and mm. uh, 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 minus Brahminism, Br Brahminism should be uh, attacked. Mm. Can we think uh, uh, along those lines as a more humane way, given the record of history, which have had such grand projects of you know, changing society? It's a very interesting proposition, uh, Sanjeev. Uh, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, uh, we can try it. Uh, uh, but, you know, let, let me reflect a little bit on this uh, suggestion of yours. You know, uh, uh, you can actually uh, organize all the jatis, not caste, because caste is a system which has its own structural reason. Now, uh, that actually failed any kind of initiative at the level of jatis coming together. So that's the uh, that's the problem. I agree with you. That kind of really. So, uh, but how to actually produce or force some kind of a emancipatory solidarity among these jatis? But jatis are also, by the way, affected by a structure called a religion, and uh, they also have. Um, they have relative notion of moksha or emancipation, not the absolute notion. That I am, I am, uh, I am, I would like to seek some freedom from the upper caste, but I want to enjoy some dominance from the lower caste. So that kind of uh, tension is there. And uh, uh, when hierarchies are continuous, as Duma would say, uh, solidarity becomes all the time difficult. And Ambedkar would say there is a lag in the consciousness of all these jatis. Now one, one has to work out what uh, what is the option or device that will actually remove that lag in consciousness. For example, of OBCs, and he was very clear on OBCs. So that, uh, that can be done structurally from within or can be brought in from outside, like, like you know, very up very, very powerful option of Buddhism. And so, but that he tried uh, and and we find that only certain castes have actually taken seriously to this. Now, what is the structural reason for this, for a particular caste to become Buddhist? There is a structural reason that one has to analytically ex, uh, 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 establish that there is a structural reason as to why Maharsa of Maharashtra have actually become new Buddhists on priority. Is it is it because they were actually fa they were fascinated by the charismatic leadership of Ambedkar? No, I think there was a democratic process that went into uh, making this solidarity, making this uh, mobilization possible. But the same kind of mobilization doesn't take place in other jatis, and therefore you find that a common agenda for emancipation uh, doesn't have a future of or success at this level. But we must definitely try. Should we try as a jati or we should, should we try as a group or we should, we should we try as individuals? But I think we should try as an individual as it starts from uh, individuals actually emerges from the separation between object and subject. Uh, have they got that consciousness Sanju to separate themselves from being an object? So that is the real challenge and we, uh, politic, political parties or any party, including the communists, haven't really focused much on this. Yeah, I agree with your comment on that, you know, because there you find that there's a, there's no moksha, but there's only revolution, revolutionary emancipation, that's it. But you know, society doesn't move in that direction. It's the rushing mode, not the reaching mode. Reaching mode is nirvana. It goes slow. You might find uh, difficulties, you might set, issue some setbacks, some defeats as well, but you are there. So that is uh, much difficult. That's why it is a disputed kingdom. And Ambedkar's, with that, this is, wow, expression is so important, I think. We can really uh, decode it further. Thanks, Sanju, for your uh, comment. Thank may you. I May I ask? Yes, Pankaji. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sir, this Buddhist conception of Nibbana, the background there is that taking birth itself is the greatest trouble. Bhav being 
itself is seen as a disease as a rogue and it is because of that that buddha is called mahabhishaj because he treats he uh, he treats this disease which is called bhava being itself is the greatest trouble being born being born is seen as the trouble and that is why the literal meaning of nibbana is um, bujjana bujja hmm so bujjana the the root cause of being born is eradicated ha ah. so how do you respond to this uh... yeah so i think i will respond only from the ambedkaran point of view i don't have any other it's a new buddhist point of view i think in new buddhism of ambedkar uh, 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 he would not rubbish the very existence of a being actually he will uh, and uh, that's it that's the buddhist principle that's some kind of buddhism uh, i think there is some there are different uh, dispensations in buddhism there are as many as 27 of them so uh, so we have uh, this new buddhist dispensation becomes so appealing because it, is, it doesn't rubbish the life actually celebrates the birth and but actually it actually gives uh, some kind of cadence and reverence to this life and giving reverence is uh, is, is, is an ethical challenge Uh, that has to be actually met in 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 company with others, because ethics is to really uh, bring in somebody into your framework of imagination, emotions, or maybe philosophical propositions. You can do all that, but you know, uh, to abandon something as undesirable or rubbish it or uh, what kind of some kind of cynicism to rubbish it is not the idea of new Buddhism. and that's why i think that the real the agency becomes possible only because you are born and if it is uh, if it is a passive intervention then i think there is no need for uh, nirvana it is all closed matter there is a closure on it right sir yeah. thank you thank you elis would you like to say something asha ji yes uh can we can we have uh, alice is she there uh asha ji ha just one minute please i'll come back to you uh, anant ji professor anant giri are you there professor anant giri okay then we'll have uh, Anybody else, and then uh, perhaps uh, Professor Yogesh will be the last one. The last one. Yes, Asadi. Uh, Asadi. Asadi. Good evening, and uh, good evening to Professor Gopal Guru. Yes, so please go ahead. Nice, please go ahead. Yes, it was nice uh, listening to um, Professor Guru, and I am uh, joining you from the <laughs> from the road. So. Uh, the little i you know i was listening to professor guru being on the road in odisha <laughs> mm. so prof- professor guru might have uh, touched it so i just wanted to say that uh, in uh, in um, explore in professor guru's engagement with uh, mokhya from ambedkar and and daya krishna's uh, engagement with mokhya and uh, the whole critic and uh, your emphasis on social mokhya and in what way we can think it further the mokhya of society and and that mm-hmm. is much more relational but that immanent mokhya also has layers of transcendence again my apology i have not been able to listen to the nuances of your thought but as a theme in this discourse i thought that the rethinking uh, mokhya how it also has to cultivate uh, an imamens you know which is socially engaged the social imamens but that social imamens also has layers of transcendence and that social imamens does include social liberation for example you know creating a much more uh, you know um, much more facilitative social environment social condition for growth individual and societal for example reducing child mortality 
uh, would be an element of uh, social mukya, creating a condition for social freedom, where we are free from fear, you know, would be an element of social mukya. So these are my related, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, provisional thoughts, and I request Professor Guru's uh, thoughts on. Yeah, yeah, I mean, Ananta. Yeah, I mean, Ananta. 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 Yes, please. Yeah, I'm still. Thank yeah, you I'm still. for Thank joining. You will come in the road when you are mobile. Are you still mobile? Are you still mobile? Yes, I, I, I can listen to you. I can listen to you. Anantha ji, can you please switch off your audio, please? Yes, I'm doing. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, I think we can. Okay. Hear okay. He's not. He's not able to hear me. Anyway, but I will. Uh, I think uh, what he's suggesting is that uh, eminence is the sphere of eminence. Is not without transcendence. There's a layers. Yeah, definitely. There's transcendence is in, internal to eminence. Uh, when you are actually transcending, you are trans going from one stage to another stage. You are leaving one in order to adopt another one. And so the the transcendence is already uh, there. But if you if you use transcendence in a tautological sense of the term, then that it becomes difficult. So you have something which is transcendence so which actually has no respect for the eminence then there is a problem and mo most of the idealist philosophers do that actually so we are uh, we are we have to be very skeptical about this kind of treatment so that is it so transcendence of course is eminent and as you suggested you know uh, giving doses to uh, saving child from nutrition you know malnutrition and things like that is of course important because human being is at the center of our attention and if it is at that, if human being is at that center of your attention, uh, his or her moksha, of course, his mukti is so important. There's no doubt about it. Thank you, sir. So, if there is no other question, maybe we can uh, go to uh, Professor Yogesh Gupta for the last uh, discussion, last question from her. Professor Yogesh Gupta. Oh, it's not a question. I mean, thank you, Vashaji, for giving me some time. It's, neither it's a remark nor it's a clarification, but just I just want to say, can I say? Hello? Yes, sir, go ahead. I'm yeah. Sir, I think that Nirvan, achieving Nirvan is an everyday affair in Ambedkar. It's an everyday affair. Yeah. And, and achieving see, or realization in every moment. Ah, at every moment. Every moment. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, if it is, then how one can cultivate or get this, this the the I, the values of manushiki and manavata and moral yes. goodness or equality? I mean, how one can achieve at individual level, solely at individual level? How one? Can this to this to 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 one is a matter of achieving every day or every moment. Yeah, you have no scope for remaining spectators and watching from outside. You have to be the part of that collective project. Yeah. Collective to have the urgency in the in the interest of larger humanity, you must really feel quite urgent and necessitate to really go on doing it. You can't even silent and uh, in and uh, uh, actually uh, involve you into yourself. Uh, there are people who, and that's why Ambedkar really starts not from imagination but from from truth. That is it. The truth is that people don't really actually take initiative. Oh yeah, our India ke andar koi sochta nahi hai. Every time I have to be constantly watchful or awakened and yeah, yeah, develop myself, myself. Yeah, you, you, okay. can't send your, you can't send your consciousness on holiday. You have to be all the time active. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Asha, may I ask a small question? 
very very small alok ji hai yes this will be the last question yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. i just want to know uh, gopal ji ha boli alok ji how do you how do you evaluate this whole effort of ambedkar from hmm. moksha to nirman whether it is a success or a failure or possibilities are there in terms of especially in terms of dalit politics and dalit movement of the mm. country today mm. yeah i think bilkul sahi aapne bola hai ki wo abhi i mean this is uh, it is not a failure or, or a complete success it is a possibility of a success and that people actually are motivated some but that motivation is actually put off because of some kind of a politics that they do the so uh, actually the the, the primary uh, primary need is to actually engage at least in conversation that means you lad you, you are not afraid of somebody who is raising questions you are actually confident to confront those questions maybe find solutions together but that process of dialoging conversing interacting uh you require uh, interlocutors or you require fellow travelers to actually uh, do the job but that space that sphere actually shrinking on every day basis because of the very nature of pragmatic very pragmatic nature of politics and politi- and politics dalit politics particularly so my concern is that actually we should bring in politics rather in a pure form to actually initiate dialogue for the for in favor of uh, nirvana that is to to trade on part of righteousness righteousness meaning that you have to actually see that uh, this what is right for you is to actually take people along with you to to redeem you are actually reach tathagata because you are a redeemer you redeem that uh, particular possibility so that's it thank you thank you yeah thank you so much professor uh, guru uh, yeah, i guess uh, professor kl sharma sir uh, will as a will give uh, presidential remarks i suppose professor kl sharma here yeah. thank you uh, thank you very much professor gopal guru for your constructive and creative lecture on the uh, ambedkar's concept of emancipation from moksha to emancipation uh, now our, our learned uh, participant raised number of issues uh, there are some especially uh, uh, people know those who have uh, read because i have not read ambedkar but so i know a bit about uh, his thoughts he raised number of issues about the buddhism he did not accept it as it is hmm so uh, he also constructed the uh, nirvan and then uh, causes of suffering and monks and a number of people he raised number of issues about that the the issue is that uh, uh, the how when we, when we use the word alok tandon ji another also raised the issue when we use the word neo buddhism generally in my mind comes immediately the tabbit tibetan uh, mm. neo buddhism or zen buddhism and so on so uh, in it by itself it is all right that you have you have given a constructive point of view and this concept is a uh, quite different from buddhistic original concept of nirvana because nirvana can be reached according to uh, buddha in our heart at, at present moment or it is a enlightenment uh, yes is within us and do not seek from it outer outer world or from other people mm-hmm. and then that you you that this approach is quite different from and we wish you know the ambit calls approach because he uh, radically he gave a radical interpretation of so- निर्वाण इसको बंद कर देना 
Yogesh Gupta, please switch off, switch off your audio. So, uh, actually, he, uh, he gave a radical interpretation of the Nirvana and other concepts of things. So, because he says that we need uh, uh, to create a communities yes. uh, uh, that unlock uh, human potential and ideal, uh, dignity. That is the Nirvana for him. Yes. So, uh, and then not only this, uh, he doesn't believe in that uh, mindfulness and all these things. Yes. Uh, and he says that for that, you know, you use a different level of education and something. Like mm. But what I'm, I'm, I am more interested in that because most of the people nowadays, I am not talking about in terms of the caste changing, some people are becoming a Buddhist or all. But Buddhism is more uh, uh, popular nowadays. And in those those who want the peace of mind and enlightenment. Mm -hmm. So most of the people are following the Buddhism, not as a caste or you know they are changing the way, but those who really want the peace of mind and enlightenment, they follow the uh, Buddhism. And uh, the, the, popularity. Uh, the popularity is that, you know, I would tell you the uh, in uh, Europe and the US, uh, most of the psychologists and philosophical counselors using Buddhistic techniques to cure the diseases by of the uh, diseases of the desires or emotions and uh, a kind of psychological improvement also. So uh, this this is another dimension of, of Buddhist which is what people are taking. Okay? This is the, your construction is all right. It's very good and then. And you have given a, uh, also discussed this, but but my my uh, contention is that so there is another dimension of Buddhism which people are thinking with that, and those who are interested in more peaceful of life and all these things, and uh, this is the Buddhism as a technique are being used now. It is very popular among the uh, psychologists and the clinical psychology. So I, I thank you very much for again uh, your lecture creative and constructive lecture with him and all the participants. Thank you very much for your kind patient listening to my lecture and comments. <coughs> Dr. Pankaj Pasutia ji. <clears throat> Pankaj ji. Yes, ma'am. Please. please. I feel very, very privileged to be invited to propose a vote of thanks at the 10th Daya Krishna Memorial Lecture organized by Daya Krishna Academic Foundation. We are deeply grateful to Professor Gopal Guru for his profound lecture on the topic Ambedkar's conception of emancipation from Moksha to Nirvana. We are really grateful to you, sir, for, for this remarkable address. Sir, in this series of lectures, we always look forward to listening to not only new and <coughs> perspectives, but perspectives from which we get a sense of intellectual enrichment. I thank you for bringing up a new and different perspective. Not only perspective, but a new dimension to an age old philosophies, philosophical concepts such as moksha and nirvana. We also express our sincere thanks to all the distinguished guests who joined this event on our invitation and graced this occasion. We thank all the participants, all those who have attended this lecture. We thank, we thank them for their gracious presence, which has made this effort, this program a success. Especially thank we especially thank those who have participated in the discussion. Our profound thanks to Professor K. L. Sharma for presiding over this function and to Professor Asha Mukherjee. Not only for organizing this particular event, but for the selfless services she has been offering all along. Thank you all. Hope to see you all again sometime soon. Thank you. Very good. Thank you so much.
Thank you. Have a good Thank you so much, much, Professor Kapadia. Have a good day and take care of life. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you. Namaskar. Namaskar. Hello.